ask the dear Savior what he had purchased for me when at Calvary he died. For all my past and all my problems, he just said that he'll provide all things. Sorry. Every need supplied There's healing Cleansing, sweet peace inside, and every need supplied. If I had to name the greatest blessing he's given. How would I decide? For after he saved me, I just have to say that every need he supplied. Every need supplied There's healing, cleansing, sweet peace inside Supply. He's all I need. He's all I need. Jesus is all I need. He satisfies my needs supply. Jesus is all I need. Every need supply. Every need supplied There's healing, cleansing, sweet peace inside Every need supplied Ha 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 he Brother Lloyd's going to do testimony tonight, but I remembered my announcement. I bless Brother Dan's heart. I punched him. I said, I remember what it was.
Uh, Brother Frank gave me one to announce in his place, but we do have a meeting next Sunday night. Um, but Miss Janet is going to be coming in and helping Miss Candy kind of move into those shoes and help with the nursery. So nursery workers, if you're getting calls and texts from Miss Janet, she's just doing her job. She's going to be reminding everybody when their times are to serve and things like that. So uh, thank you, Miss Janet, for stepping up. And uh, I grew up, and I know all three of her kids now. Uh, I went to school with one or two of them, and then <clears throat> uh, the little one now comes to our youth program. So uh, she done a good job with them, so I can vouch for her. But um, y'all welcome Miss Janet into that role. And ladies, y'all work together and help our nursery you know, be as awesome as it can be. Brother Lloyd, you go ahead. Thank you, Russ. Uh, this time of the year, I want to give a word of testimony and thank the Lord for what happened five years ago. I feel like He extended my life then. April 30th, 2016, we were visiting our daughter in Wake Forest, North Carolina. About two or three in the morning, my wife woke up, woke, woke up, said I was thrashing about in the bed, heard, heard, urging. Sounds that wasn't, wasn't familiar. And uh, she went and got her daughter and her, my son-in-law. Never could, they never were able to wake me. And they called 911. And the 911 operator said, is that the patient that I hear making those noises? And they said, yes. They said, you need to start CPR. And my son-in-law had had the training, but he had never had done it before. And I really... he. Did it real well on me. Cause the next four days, I was really sore in the chest there, where he'd been mashing on me. But the uh, 911 uh, sent the paramedics. They came and rushed me to the hospital there in Wake Forest. And they saw that I was pretty severe. They stabilized me and then took me on to another hospital in Raleigh, North Carolina. All this took about 30 minutes. I never was awake and didn't know what was going on. They discovered, found out that I'd had a seizure and real bad seizures. And, uh, praise the Lord, the only thing that's visible now from the seizure, from the, can't even think of the word now. Anyway, this, I uh, went on an anti-seizure medication, wasn't allowed to drive for nearly two years, 22 months to be exact. Now, now, driving again. And the only visible signs from the stroke is the mouth drawn back a little bit on the left side. I just have to praise the Lord for the extra time. And God is good. God is good. All the time. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Lloyd. On Sunday nights, we have testimonies. And he approached me and said, could I share mine of my fifth year uh, anniversary since my stroke. It's not much to celebrate, but it is good to know God spared him, and, and we love him and appreciate him around here. Amen? Um, once in a while, I preach a topical message. They're easy to prepare and not real in-depth. I, I do like Hayden Robinson of Dallas Seminary. When I do, I preach when I ask God to forgive me for it. I'm just kidding. A topical message means you go all over the place. It's not going to a chapter and explaining in-depth details. And it's easy to prepare those. And I'm going to do a series, which really this is part of, on different creatures of the Bible, but this is not really what I'm going to do with the other ones. I'm going to do more exposition and more in-depth study of things. But we're going to look at Job chapter 12 tonight. Um, and, and I don't use other people's stuff very often. Um, tonight, maybe for the first time you'll hear me use someone else's stuff. Let me tell you how I got this message. A friend of mine said, oh, I remember an old preacher. He's dead now. But he preached this funny message about fish. He said, I never forget it. And he, he gave me two or three points of it. And so I just took that and, and went with it. So you're getting that tonight. Uh, it's, it's something we'll enjoy. You may laugh. You won't laugh out loud, but, uh, we'll have, We'll have a good time tonight looking at God's Word. Job chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. Job chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. We will use this passage for other messages as well. And we're, we're just working on a, we got a machine to do PowerPoint. <clears throat> so that's why I'm doing this tonight. We're going to get the machine working and figure out how to do it. And then we're going to do some PowerPoint stuff. And you'll enjoy that a little different than we've done here so far. But get Job 12, 
in your Bibles and stand when you have that. We're going to read verses 7 and 8. Job 12, 7 and 8. <clears throat> Here's what Job says. Ask, but ask now the beast, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Fishes is, is grammatically accurate. When there's more than one species, we use species, <laughs> we use fishes. If we say fish, it means plural. It can be a lot of bass, but when it's fishes, it's more than one species. You understand that, right? So he says, or ask the fishes of the sea, and they shall declare, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. So we learn from God's creatures. God bless us as we take a look in your word in the book for a walk in the world. Thank you for tonight, for being together. In Jesus' name, amen. We, we learn from creation. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. So we know that creation has a lot to teach us. And there's a lot of really interesting fish. You know, if you watch these shows, National Geographic or, or any of these shows, you see these fish that are just unbelievably spectacular, you know, that light up. And, and there's one angler fish that puts its tongue out and makes it look like a worm and then kills the, just fascinating stuff. And the fish are, are God's, part of God's creation. And the Bible says we can learn from the fish. Well, I don't think God intended us for, for us to learn exactly what I'm going to share tonight, but we're going to have a interesting time looking at 10 different species of fish and talking about how they compare to people. So look at Proverbs 6. The first one we're going to look at is the largemouth bass. And you know where I'm going, right? The largemouth bass. They swim with their mouth open. Certain fish, sharks, and so forth, swim with their mouth open. The largemouth bass actually has muscles it can use to suck things in. But they swim around with their mouth open. And there's a lot of people we know that are like that. They never shut their big mouth, right? And I told you that we're going to have fun, but uh, we also hope to speak to hearts. Chapter 6, Proverbs 6, 19. We're going to read a bunch of verses, 6, 17, and 19. Verse 17 says, it says in verse 16, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination in him. Then verse 17, it says, A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, but a lying tongue. Then verse 19, A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord. So the big mouth bass, the big mouth Christian, is one who lies, it's one who tells uh, who bears false witness, one who lies, and one who can sow discord. And I know there's been a lot of Christians in my life, and you've known some too, that love to sow discord. They love to stir up things. They don't realize it, maybe, but they do that. Look at chapter 10 and verse 19. We're going to six or seven verses in Proverbs 10, 19. Proverbs 10, 19. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. You know, some people like the bass can't ever keep their mouth shut. But here the Bible says, if you can stop talking sometimes, you'll be wise. My mother was a godly woman, a quiet woman. She's just like the biblical example of what a woman should be. And in my life, I never heard my mother gossip. We had an aunt one time that did something. We don't know what she did. My mother was talking to my dad. None of us kids were never knew. We asked years later. She never would tell us, and to this day we don't know. My mother wouldn't do that. And I learned so much from her. Now, I talk way too much. But I learned from my mom that it's good sometimes just to keep your mouth shut. Even this week, I had something come up, and I wanted so bad to say something, and the Holy Spirit said, no, be quiet, stay out of it, don't say a word. And he gave me the ability to do that. So look at chapter 11, verse 13. Next chapter, a talbearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. You ever share a secret with someone and they blab it? They're like the largemouth bass. Just They can't keep their mouth shut. And, and those kinds of people can't be trusted. Chapter 16, verse 28. <clears throat> you know, we could do 100, 100 plus verses in Proverbs on that matter, on the mouth, the tongue. <clears throat> but 16, 28. 
A froward man soweth strife, and a whisper separateth chief friends. Years ago, I was whispering to one of my brothers in the lobby of the church, and my dad said, boys, it's not polite to whisper in front of people. They will think you're talking about them. I thought, dad, that's ridiculous. Now I think that's wise. If someone's whispering and you walk up, then they automatically presume you're talking about something you shouldn't have been talking about. They may be insecure and think you're talking about them, even though you weren't. So whispering is something we have to be careful with. Do I do all of the above? I do. We've all done this. We all make mistakes. Chapter 17, verse 9. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth. Very friends means close friends. You can ruin friendships by opening your mouth and repeating things. When someone tells you something in confidence, keep it in confidence. I have a habit I learned from a friend. When someone comes up and says, can I tell you something, but I want to I want to ask you to keep it in confidence, I always say, now wait a minute. I'm not sure I can. If you want to try and trust me, but I mean, in my life I've made mistakes, I'll try. Sometimes it's been things, I, and I had to say, hey, hold on a minute, I can't keep that confidential. I've got to call the police on you, you know. I mean, I'm, that's an exaggeration. I call that a hyperbole. But there are times you have to stop people and say, no, no, I, I don't want to hear any more of that. But once you listen, you're obligated to keep it in confidence. Chapter nine, 17, verse 28, same chapter. Even a fool, now look at this, even a fool when he holdeth his peace is counted as wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. I mean, sometimes it's just good to just be quiet. And if you're not very sharp, people can still think you're wise because you've learned to shut your mouth. The Bible says you can control a ship with a rudder. You can control a horse with a bit. But you can't control the tongue. The tongue can no man tame. It's the most sinful part of our body. You know? My tongue helps me lick an ice cream bowl pretty good, too. It's not just talking. I mean, our tongues do a lot of damage to our bodies and to other people. So this matter of being a large mouth bass, I don't want to be that. 18.8, last one on this fish. The words of a towel bearer are as wounds. They go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Spreading towels is harmful. One of the best shows ever on television, I would still watch it. I haven't seen it in a long time, but I'd still watch it if it came on as Little House in the Prairie. And old Nels Olson's daughter was a brat, and if she ever found out something, she'd ruin people with it. You know, we all hated her. She was a great actress. Then they adopted a little girl who was just as bad, named Nancy. So it was Nellie and Nancy, you know? And constant conflict in that show because of her mouth. And little old Laura was spunky, and she'd find ways to get even. But I used to think about that and think that that kind of a show teaches so many good lessons, you know. Michael Landon was a Jew. His real name was Eugene Orowitz, and he was a javelin thrower in college. And he was a pretty religious man, but he, to my knowledge, he wasn't born again, but everything he ever did was clean and wholesome. We don't have much TV like that anymore. Everything's about sex and sitcoms and... It's nauseating, you know, the network television's gone. But, you know, I, I, th those shows had some great lessons. And I even would watch those at times and think, you know, I mean, that's something I need to work on my kids with, you know. Little kids can be hurtful. And if we don't teach them when they're young, they do it when they're old. All right, Proverbs 14, 14, go back. Our next fish is the crayfish, the crayfish. Why are we talking about the crayfish? Because it goes backwards more than forwards. It goes backwards more than forward. A lot of Christians are like that. They get saved. They don't ever progress. They don't read their Bibles. They don't pray. They just keep going backwards. Proverbs 14, 14 says this. The backslider in his heart should be filled with his own ways. The backslider in his heart should be filled with his own ways. That little crayfish, if you watch it, it just is always going backwards. You know, it's amazing. The lobster does that as well. But there's several species that do that. And unfortunately, there are Christians that go backwards more than they go forward. Next, we're looking at Proverbs 18. 
The next one we're going to talk about, we're going to go to the New Testament as well, is the stingray. You know what I'm going to say here, right? They hurt people. They offend people. Now, this verse is worth marking in your Bible, Proverbs 18, 19. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. When you hurt people, when you hurt people, it's hard to ever gain their confidence or win them back. I tell you, this is, this is something I've seen over and over and in my own life. Years ago, I had a friend named Patrick Paragoy. And uh, I liked him. We were friends. I taught him a little bit about fishing, and he caught fish. But I would do certain things to agitate him. And one day he said to me, for someone who wants to be my friend, you sure hurt me a lot. And I went home that day, and I, I was in my bedroom. I was a young Christian teenager, and I thought, Lord, why do I do that? One time, one of my nephews, a ball player, I was teasing him about part of his basketball game that wasn't that good. And he said, why do you say things like that? You know, over the years, there's been other times. I had a, a GI, uh, he was a Green Bray one time, had appendicitis, and he was in the hospital on the Panama City side of Panama about an hour and a half away. I thought he's a Green Bray. He doesn't need me. Do you know, a couple weeks later, he wouldn't hardly speak to me, and I said, everything all right? He said, why wouldn't you come and visit me in the hospital? And I'm thinking, you're a Green Beret. Appendicitis? Get tough, man. But you know, not everyone's the same. That offended him where someone else wouldn't be offended. And 20 years later, I was preaching in North Carolina, and he was in the church. And there were three people in that church that got saved in our ministry, so the pastor asked me to come and speak. And we were out afterwards eating, and he said, I'll never forget when I had appendicitis and you didn't come and visit me. And I thought, oh, my word. Now, I could say to him, you need to grow up. You're a Green Beret. But look at it from his perspective. I failed. Okay, even though he's an hour and a half away and you're thinking you didn't fail. I did, though, because he got offended. And some people are easily offended. Now, let me just say to you, if you're always offended, the Bible said, blessed are those that love the word and nothing shall offend them. So a strong Christian is not easily offended. If I hurt one of you or was rude to you or did something that disappointed you and you quit church, it says a lot about both of us. This is Brother Dan wasn't careful. You offended someone, but it also says about you, you need to be a little tougher. We're supposed to be soldiers of the cross. So let's look at both sides of that coin. We don't want to offend people because when we do, it's harder to win them than it is to conquer a city. People just don't get over it. But on the other side of that, we need to be strong enough. As a pastor in a ministry for 40 years, youth pastor and then starting a church and senior pastor in all the positions and places I've had, you know I've been treated badly at times, and my family's been treated badly, and I, I've learned to let it be water off the back because I know if I'm hurt, I'm not going to be effective, so I have to be strong in the Lord and the power of might and be a soldier because people say things. I mean, people sometimes blame stuff on the pastor that has nothing to do with him being the pastor. It's just his fault because he's the pastor, you know? And it, So you have to be strong. And so both sides of that have to be looked at. So look at Romans 14. Romans 14, and, and, and this is not very deep tonight. I told you that, but there's some practical stuff here tonight. Romans chapter 14, more on the stingray. Romans 14, 21. Here it says, It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Then it says, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself, and that which he is allowed. And then it goes on. Listen, verse 22. And he, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he, because he eateth not of faith. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So we need to be careful not to offend others. And in their presence, we have to sometimes give up things. If I'm friends with a Jew... And we go out to lunch, and I want to try to reach him. It's not wise for me to order the barbecue. I'm trying to reach him. He may be offended by that. A gent, he's eating with the Gentiles, a big step for him anyway. 
and if I eat the barbecue, the pork barbecue, I may offend him. And, and that may not happen in my lifetime of yours, but that's the type of thing we need to be careful of. In fact, Paul says, um, look here, he says, let not us, verse 13, therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this, rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Also, if let's just say um, someone in this church has a weakness, and I don't have that weakness, and I spend time with them, if I do what they can't do in their presence, it may cause them to go back and do it and fall. And I'm trying to think of an example, and I don't have a good one right now. But um, if if I'm going out with somebody who's on Weight Watchers, there's a good one, and they're strict on their diet, and I'm just eating the cake, and I'll take the pie, and I'll take the ice cream too, you know. I'm going out to tea with me, myself, and I. I ate all the ice cream, and I ate all the cake. You know how that goes. And I'm doing that. They may be, have a difficult time eating one because they're looking at my food, and they're drooling, you know. That's a dumb example, but you understand that we have to be careful not to offend other people. And also we have to be careful not to judge other people in their freedoms. Paul says this, if someone has a conviction against eating meat, and of course Jews really struggle with this one, don't eat meat in their presence. And don't judge them for not eating meat. But what's the flip side of that? If Someone eats meat, you shouldn't judge them for eating meat. We've had things I put out there when I was here last time, a little piece of paper on women wearing pants, and basically said it's not taught that it's wrong in Scripture. I gave a clear teaching on that. But if I know someone who has a conviction against something, I am not going to throw it in their face that I'm free to do that. And I'm also not going to expect them to abide by my convictions. Here's what's happened over the years in churches. I had in my church people who thought women wearing pants was wrong, and they decided to judge every woman that wore pants. And I had to actually call a meeting and call those ladies in and say, this stops now. I did it in love, but I said, your conviction is to wear dresses all the time. Wonderful. That's what the Holy Spirit told you, but he hasn't told them that. So don't judge them. And then I had to say to the other people, don't call them legalist and judge them because that's their conviction. The Bible said we all have to be persuaded in our own mind. So we will all have different convictions. Did you know no two of us in this building right now have the same convictions in every category? Some of you have freedom to do things I don't have the freedom to do. And I have the freedom to do some things you don't have the freedom to do. You can't judge me and I can't judge you. We're all free, you know. Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 I know that people have are all over the board on places. I mean, I know I've had someone. Some of you guys have said to me in church, I, "I don't like it when a preacher preaches in jeans." And I say, "Well, I've never done that. You know, I've done it maybe at a youth rally or something, but I've always worn suits and dressed up." But I can't say it's sinful for somebody to preach in jeans, can I? Is there a verse? No, we just don't like it. And, you know, that's the thing. We've got to come to the place in our spiritual walk where we don't get upset about things that are conviction and opinion-oriented that are not in the Bible. Now, I'm, I, the Bible teaches against immodesty. So if somebody's immodestly dressed, then I'm going to say to them, I don't want you to sing or do this. And we have, you know, certain acceptable things. Maybe as a pastor, if I have a guest speaker, I may say to him, you know, our people would rather you wear some nice pants and a nice shirt. That's okay to do that. But how many times have we gone into a place and someone's maybe in jeans and we don't like it and so we automatically write them off and we're not going to listen to anything they say? We have to be more mature than that. We have to be more mature than that. Let him that has the freedom to eat meat ju not judge him that doesn't, and let him that doesn't not judge him that does. Right? That's what the Bible teaches. So we can be offending people on either side of that. And that, that's, that's tough because all of you are thinking right now, 
Brother Dan's really challenging me to think, and I don't know about that. That's new for me, you know? Um, and it's interesting, my son Daniel, you know, this, I've learned this in the South. You can say anything about some of you who say, bless their heart. My son Daniel, bless his heart, he went to Africa, and he was scheduled to speak in some churches. And he went to the church. He said, Dad, I didn't know what to do. I went into the church, and already I'm right away embarrassed because there's so many topless women in the church. I'm just really struggling. And I said, well, Daniel, I, I don't know. I'd probably not go. I mean, I just couldn't have handled it, okay? just, just. I'm 64 years old, but I wouldn't want to try to preach with women topless sitting out there, all the Africans. And he said, so I finally get up there, and I'm finally determined, and I'm trying to look out there and not look down there, and I'm preaching, and then a lady just takes her top off and starts breastfeeding right in front of me. And he said, Dad, it was so hard. And I, I said, what did you do? He said, I just preached the gospel. But now, I don't think I could take that. <laughs> I think if I went to Africa, I'd be teaching a little more on covering. <laughs> but Dan, you know, if someone's really backslid, backslid, they'd want to go to Africa, I guess, but that's bad. But I admired that Daniel could get through it. He was a bigger man than I was because I'd have been like, oh, my word. I, 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 I don't know. But think of the missionary that goes to a place like that. New Guinea, or some of those places, and everyone's naked. Where do you start? You know, the first thing you preach is not, you know, dress modestly. You, you try to preach salvation first, and you have to be mature enough. And do you know, as Americans, we see things a certain way. We don't adapt well to other cultures. <laughs> this is funny. We, I'm way off the subject, but I'm having fun. My dad... Uh, Years ago, came to Okinawa. I think I might have told you this. Did I tell you that story? And we were invited to a Japanese family's home to eat. And so we we're getting in the car, and we're heading to the other side of the island. I said, Dad, we're going to a Japanese. Japanese! I said, yeah, and you'll have to take your shoes off. That's I'm not taking my shoes off for no Jap. They shot my buddy Sherman Breesman up in World War II, and I'm not taking my... I'm, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Dad's not going in. <laughs> And for 20 minutes, my, my wife and my mother, and we all just kept saying to him, these are not the same people. They had an evil emperor, and he was bad. Dad, you need to be nice. And my dad ended up taking his shoes off, enjoying the meal, and he got in the van, and we're headed back to the house, and he said, boy, they were really nice people. I don't understand that. I said, Dad, they love the Lord. Americans, we don't, we don't adapt too well. You know, I just never forget that dirt, those dirty Japs shot my buddy up in World War II. You know, he lived, we knew Mr. Reisman, but my dad was still carrying that. I mean, 50 years later, you know. So we have to understand that people are coming over here from other countries. They're going to do things differently. And we have to be Christ-like. And we can't expect everybody to do everything the way we do it. I'm not talking about illegal immigration. I'm just talking about people who come to our country, and when we go to other countries, not offending them in their culture. And, and we have to be mature. We're supposed to always be stronger and bigger. Now look at Romans 14, verses 3 to 5. I rambled way too much, but in Romans 14, 3 through 5, Paul says this, let him that eateth despise, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master, he standeth or falleth. Yea, ye shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And I actually forgot to introduce our fish. The flounder has two eyes on one side and can only see things one way. The flounder, two eyes on one side, can only see things one way. They cannot ever see things from another perspective. I remember um, we had in our church so many different groups. The Samoan people were some of my favorite people. They knew how to eat. 
I mean, these people could cook. And I loved Fafoy, and she would make the ribs and this pot of fish and all this stuff. It was fantastic. But I remember the first time I went to one of these big Samoan dinners, and I got the big scooper and went down to get myself some soup, and I put in my bowl the head, and there the eyes were looking at me. There's the head. I got the head. And I'm like, oh, my word, I, what do I do now? You know? I wasn't going to eat it. And I'm in a different culture, and I'm with different people, and they're good people. You know, to them, and it's true, that head is no more dirty than our chicken is. But our culture's different. Yeah, we, we eat dirty, rotten, nasty chicken. You know, I love fried chicken. And I love fried fish. I could eat a river of fish, uh, an ocean of fish, and I, I couldn't eat a river of liver. But we eat things that to other people is disgusting. And yet we go over there, we visit them, and we think their food's disgusting. And, it, you know, I had this fish, I don't remember what happened. But I know that people, I've eaten so many different things over the years now, I've eaten iguana tail, and I've eaten just a variety of things. And I would have never tried them, but I came to the point in my life where I can't always offend people. I pastor a church with 40 nationalities in it, and I'm going to have to try other things. And at our mission dinner, our Ghanians would have a table, and the Koreans had a table, and the Filipinos had a table. We had all these international tables, and certain tables I'd like to go to a little more than others, if you know what I mean. I don't want to say which. But certain food I just loved, and I'd go back to that table, and my wife would say, now remember, you need to go over to the other table over there and get something. And I'd be like, oh, I don't like that stuff. <laughs> but the Bible said we'll esteem others better than ourselves. And I could only see one, things one way. When I first got to Japan, I didn't like sushi. When I left Japan, I loved sushi. So things changed. But we have to be tolerant of others. And Paul says, don't just see things one way. Don't judge other people who are different. My mother-in-law and father-in-law went to some wonderful people in a church. They were black people, and they had chitlins. I'm glad I wasn't there. Because I was a meat cutter for 10 years. I used to work down here in the corner of Chickamauga Avenue. I was a meat guy in there with 18 other guys and for several years. And... When the chitlins came in one time, I had to put them on the end of the hose and flush them out. And that was the most disgusting experience ever in my life. I couldn't imagine eating them. But I know people that eat brains. I don't think they have a lot of brains to do that, but they do. They eat them. But you know what? We have to not be judgmental. We said enough on this, right? We can't just see things our way. When two people get married, they're so much different, and they have to get along. They have to see things differently. When I was first married, I thought, what in the world's wrong with my wife's family? <laughs> they do everything wrong. Well, that's because my mom taught me a certain way. But after years of marriage, I've learned the word compromise, and we, we've learned, and we do things differently. And, and that's, that, that's part of being a mature person. Can you accommodate your spouse? Well, I've said too much here as well. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We've got to move quicker because I'm, I'm almost out of time and I'm only halfway through. So we'll go quicker. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. You know this verse. I quoted it the other day. It says here in 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The next fish is a shad fish. They're dead as soon as they come out of the water. Sometimes people get baptized, and that's it. Their Christian experience is over. They're dead, nothing changes. And we talked about a few weeks ago how that some people profess to be saved, and when there's never a change, something's wrong. Shadfish, I had an experience. My dad came down fishing. We were catching all these shiny little fish. My dad thought we were having a great day. Had all these fish in a bucket. Someone came up and said, you can't eat those. They're shad fish. They're terrible. So we started throwing back. They said, no, just throw them up on the bank and kill them. They're no good for anything. I thought, and you know, as soon as I got them out of the bucket and laid them, they were dead almost instantly. I couldn't believe how quick they died. They said, yeah, they die right away. Folks, if you're truly born again, old things have passed away. All things have become new. Next, 
the jellyfish, Ephesians 6.10. Ephesians 6.10, you know where I'm going with this as well, right? It says here, Find thee, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. The jellyfish doesn't have a backbone. A lot of Christians don't have a backbone. I was speaking in Temple Chapel years ago, and we had the soccer players were in there, and all the athletes were in there, and I was speaking to the college, and uh, I just talked about how it takes guts to be a Christian. I said, anyone can be like the world. It's easy to go along with the world and do what they do. I said, it takes guts to be a Christian and say, I don't do that. I don't go there. And I'm talking to college kids. It was very practical at the time. And I really talked about cowardice Christians versus courageous Christians. About five years later, I get a letter in the mail. Dear Professor Mao, I'm playing professional soccer here in Europe, and I just wanted to tell you something. Years ago, all these years ago, you said in chapel, it takes guts to be a Christian, and how we were either cowards and compromises or courageous. He said, I, I wanted to write you to tell you I could never get over that message. I realized I'd been a coward, and I want to be courageous. There's a lot of Christians that don't have any backbone. They're like the jellyfish. They don't stand for anything. I remember Dr. Robertson. He was not my hero. He was a good man. My pastor was my hero. I liked Dr. Robertson. I didn't agree with him on some things, but he was such a good man. But he got up one time and said, if you don't have convictions, get some. And he screamed at us in chapel, get some convictions. And I needed the rules at Tennessee Temple because I was a radical. They were good for me. Okay? I, I, you know, I... I Still don't agree with some of the rules, but I needed that structure in my life, and I needed to hear him say, get some convictions. Because I didn't have any. I have some now. I didn't have any then. Worldliness was a big part of my life. I had to change. But him saying that to me gave me some spine, you know. Next, 1 Corinthians 4.2. 1 Corinthians 4.2, and this is the sunfish. The thing about the sunfish is, they're not consistent. Moreover, it is required in a steward that a man be found faithful. Every time there's a storm, the sunfish run. You ever know Christians like that? Little problem comes along, they're done. They're gone. Some, some of them move from church to church that quick. Little problem, we're gone. Folks, and some people do that in all their relationships. They don't work through problems. They're just not faithful. And the Bible requires us to be faithful. The sunfish, when the storm comes, they run and hide. And there's Christians just like that. You can't depend on them. They're not faithful. Next, look at Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 26, and you know where I'm going with this as well. We're talking about perch. Years ago, my dad and took my brothers and they caught a hundred and something perch on the Lake Michigan Pier and they had, of course, they had to clean them all. But I remember I was envious of them catching all those perch. But the thing about perch is, Matthew 7, 26, is they love the sandy bottom. They love the sandy bottom and therefore they're vulnerable to predators. They run in schools. They all stick together, but they're always around the sand. Matthew 7, 26 says, <clears throat> and everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them shall be likened unto a foolish man who has built his house upon the sand. You know, we don't need to be like the, the perch which run in schools and build their life on the sand. Look now at 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 17. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 17. I told you this wasn't going to be deep. 14, 16, and 17, 2 Corinthians 4, 17, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, and 17, and you know these verses as well. And be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, as what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness. Verse 17, wherefore come up out from among them, and be ye separate. Thus saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll deceive you. The catfish. The catfish loves dirty water. They love the bottom. They love the bottom. I mean, they're just a dirty, filthy fish. I eat them when they're fried. 
But I always tell people, they're the store-bought kind. You know, they have the nets, and they're not eating their own, you know. And that's my excuse. But I love a fried catfish. I went up to Cross-Eyed Cricket, a place years ago. Is that place still in existence up north? Cross-Eyed Cricket up in Knoxville or Nashville. And we caught catfish and trout, and they cooked them right on the spot. And I pulled it out of that pond, and I decided I'd eat the trout. Because the catfish came out of a pond that was nasty looking. But catfish can live in the filth. And a lot of Christians are like that. They can live in the filth and not know the difference. Finally, in Matthew 7, 24, Matthew 16, 18, and you know these verses as well. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 7, 24, and I know I'm out of time. It says here in Matthew 7, 24, The wise man builds his house upon the rock. And it goes on to say, And the wind descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat down on that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Matthew 16, 18 says that we need to build our house, or that we need to base our salvation on the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is called the rock in 1 Corinthians 10, 4. The last fish is the trout. The trout's an overcomer. Lives on a rock bottom, and the trout overcomes. It swims against the current and overcomes everything. And they can only live in clean water. And that's what kind of fish we need to be, like the trout. They soar over troubled waters. They live a clean life. They build their foundation on the rocks. And, and the trout's an amazing fish. Now, this is simple tonight. I uh, almost feel guilty doing something so simple. But sometimes the simple things are helpful. And I hope you think about what kind of fish are you? Are you a crayfish? You go backwards more and forward. Are you a big mouth, large mouth bass? You know, think about that. Are you the jellyfish? You don't have any spine or the shadfish that die as soon as they get out of the water. Or are you the flounder that sees things one way? Because you have two eyes on one side of your head. What are you? And just ask yourself and learn from these little creatures that God made. Let's pray. God bless us. Thank you for the fun we've had with your word tonight. And while, Lord, I know this was simple and it wasn't hard, I just pray that it would cause us to think about our lives and how we need to be clean and separated and strong and how we need to be useful and how we need to be quiet and be everything you would have us to be. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.